all right. How's this music making you feel? Pretty confident? Yeah, like everything's going to be just fine, right? Well, that's all I'm hoping to feel too after today's interview. And stay tuned to see why. But first, welcome to Podcasting on a Plane. This is a view of aviation from both sides of the mic. It's where I give you straight talk about the greatest thing ever, which of course is aviation. My name is Brandon Gonzalez. I'm an air traffic controller at a busy general aviation airport on the West Coast, and I have an almost 25-year background in aviation as a controller, as a pilot, a flight instructor, an aircraft salesman, a ramper for a major airline, a line service guy, and a producer of aviation podcasts to the stars. Well, okay, maybe not to the stars. I just make this podcast. But thank you for listening. This podcast is my way of serving the aviation community. So, with any luck, you'll get something out of the podcast that'll help you in your aviation endeavors, whatever they might be. Private, commercial, professional, personal, I don't judge. And if you're not getting something out of it that you wish you were, well, the request lines are open 24-7 at podcastingoutaplane.com slash contact. And while you're there, you can learn more about me, the guests we've had. You can listen to past episodes, record audio messages, and feedback for the show. Send me an email. You can learn how to become a valued supporter, too. And on that note, I'd like to thank my generous patrons for helping keep this show in the air. And if you're interested in supporting the show, you can head over to podcastingoutaplane.com slash support or patreon.com slash podcasting on a plane to learn more and if i can do anything to help you just let me know if you'd like to talk you can head over to podcasting on a plane.com slash contact and schedule a session i can help you supplement your training if you like or give you a little perspective when it comes to atc stuff whatever you need and speaking of training today's episode is all about one of the major issues facing our aging general aviation training aircraft fleet now remember from last time we talked about the recent tragic crash at Embry riddle in florida it was caused by a wing detachment that's right, a wing just came off. There isn't a checklist for that. There's no amount of skill or luck or anything that can fix that. It's just game over. And we talked about an aircraft that I used to fly, which had a similar issue with a loose wing. You see, my airplane's about two and a half miles inland from the Pacific Ocean. The air's nice and humid, and it's nice and salty, probably just like in Florida. And we've got a lot of corrosive stuff going on in both places. As a matter of fact, I fly a Piper Seminole and a first-generation Cherokee 6, regularly. So I'm starting to get a little bit nervous. Is this something we need to do something about? Needless to say, I wanted to find somebody to talk with who knows this kind of thing. And luckily for me, the Daytona Beach News Journal, who covered the story originally, supplied some links to YouTube videos featuring an expert in this kind of thing. And his name is Roy Williams. Roy is the founder of Airframe Components in Kendallville, Indiana. His company refurbishes all sorts of airframe components and control surfaces that are often corroded or damaged. Roy's a true expert on what's going on structurally with our aging GA fleet. So much so, in fact, that he apparently has a whole bunch of Piper PA-28 and PA-32 wings in his shop, and he made a lot of YouTube videos on them. They're fantastic. One shows a really nice case of corrosion going on in the aft spar of a Piper PA-28 series aircraft. The links, of course, to the videos are in the show notes, and I urge you to go check them out. Even if you don't have or fly a Cherokee or anything else, they're fascinating to look at how this stuff happens. Now, Roy's quickly become one of the default go-to experts in this story, so I reached out to him to see if we could quell some of my fears. And look, I don't want to sound like some sort of aviation hypochondriac, but I really want to know if this is a systemic issue and something that needs to be dealt with ASAP. Well, luckily for us, Roy agreed to an interview, and at least as far as corrosion is concerned, I hope that by the end of this video, we can all go home feeling like, you know, things are going to be all right. And here he is today live, Mr. Roy Williams of Aircraft Components. Welcome to the show, sir. Hey, Brandon. Thanks for having me on today. This is my uh, first go at a podcast, so I hope I bring some value to uh, the show and uh, to your listeners today. Absolutely. And for anybody listening today, this has been such a cool thing to set up. Roy is actually sitting in a full-blown uh, recording studio nearby him, WAWK, I believe it is, 95 point something? Correct. Here in Kendallville. Okay, in Kendallville, Indiana. And that is a first for me. So I'm honored to have you on the show and also to be doing this through a full-blown radio station. So thanks to those guys. Well, and that's uh, Fred Inniger, uh, sportscaster here at WAWK. His son was at Purdue, I think, at the same time you were, uh, Brian Inniger. And Brian's a uh, controller in the, tr the Detroit area right now. Yeah, good times back then. It was really cool that that, uh, that sort of synchronicity happened and, and we could set this all up. That's really neat. And hey to both you guys as well. Before we get into all this technical stuff, tell me a little bit about yourself and in your business and how you got started with that. Airframe Components, originally uh, the company name was Williams Airmotive. Uh, that was started by my father back in 1980. 
At that time, it was just uh, concentrating on wing repair only. Uh, 1991, uh, after I graduated from college, I'd written a business plan on doing a spinoff business with the control surface rebuilding, uh, just to piggyback along with the wing rebuilding. And uh, uh, in 2010, uh, we just uh, bought the whole, uh, I, I bought the whole uh, business and uh, uh, renamed Airframe Components by Williams. Uh, so specifically to uh, capture the uh, essence of wing rebuilding and control service rebuilding. So is that a pretty lucrative business nowadays? <laughs> no, uh, I would say it's a very specific business. Uh, you know, if somebody has an aircraft, somebody has an aircraft with damage, somebody has an aircraft that has a damaged wing or control, uh, you know, it, it's a very small uh, uh, demographic that we're focusing on as far as uh, uh, our customer base. And, and typically, if you need my services, you're coming to look for me, not the other way around. Uh, the reason I ask you that question, though, is because I feel like our, our general aviation fleet is, is aging. Pretty bad, actually. And obviously, I realized in the mid-90s with the Guerra Act signed and so on, Cessna, of course, was able to restart production and you know, all the you know, newer Cessnas aren't having these issues. But everything before then, uh, the old Pipers, the old Cessnas, the old Beechcraft, things like that, we're starting to have a lot of issues with those, things like corrosion and such. And particularly for, for airports like mine that are pretty close to the shoreline, you know, these issues can be, can be very, very serious and actually start to worry me a little bit. So tell me a little bit about our aging general aviation fleet. Well... You know, you talk about the restart Cessnas, but even then, uh, you know, we, we talk about aging aircraft uh, in the terms of uh, ori uh, aircraft originally produced back in the 60s. And you think, you know, specifically here we're talking today about the Piper aircraft. And you think the first Cherokee flew in 1960, you know, that was 58 years ago. But even on your restart aircraft, your restart Cessnas, when they started producing those in 1997, you know, here we are 20 years removed from even the restart. So uh, let, let's, when we talk about aging aircraft, there's almost a second wave of air, aging aircraft coming on board now. So, you know, not just uh, only applies to the older aircraft, the legacy aircraft, but also your restart, uh, uh, you know, corrosion does not uh, distinguish between uh, legacy aircraft or restart aircraft, uh, you know, 1960s, 1980s. 2000s, you know, corrosion uh, uh, does not discriminate. But, uh, uh, you know, you talk about the uh, uh, aircraft, you know, and even we, we say the first Cherokee flew in 1960, but you got to think that uh, all the aircraft, let's say, produced from post-World War II, you know, when uh, the GIs are coming back and you had the uh, uh, Cessna 120s, 140s, you had the Piper Cubs, you had the uh, even the Bonanza, uh, the first Bonanza flew in what nineteen forty six maybe, so uh, you know there, there's a whole host of uh, different uh, models, different segments of uh, uh, manufacturing eras, let's say, uh, uh, when aircraft are produced. That uh, you know again, corrosion affects all of them. Sure. Now, I remember when Cessna restarted production, you know, they started with a new facility at a different airport in a different city, actually, even. But one of the biggest things that they were sort of touting about their 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 new product was that they were actually corrosion proofed internally. And, you know, when you open up the panels, you can see there's the, the green, I forget what that stuff's called, but the green anti-corrosion primer stuff, whereas the old ones, you open it up and it's just naked bare metal. You know, if, the, if a 20-year-old Cessna is going to be experiencing corrosion issues that has that type of prevention put in, I can only imagine how an aircraft that just has naked bare metal under there would be faring nowadays. So can you talk a little bit about maybe how the difference in that corrosion proofing uh, versus a non-corrosion proofed airplane would play out over time? And you know, again, when we talk about the legacy aircraft back uh, post-World War II, 40s, 50s, uh, you know, let's say 60s and 70s when the, the bulk of most GA aircraft were produced, uh, bare metal, you know, they were only designed and built with a lifespan of, let's say, 10 years. Um, you know, it was the assumption that people would uh, upgrade and buy new uh, models of aircraft just like they would cars. So, you know, it was never intended to last 58 years of, you know, if we're talking about 1960 and following. Uh, airplanes were not designed to last that long because it was thought that they would become obsolete. New models would come along. People would upgrade. 
Uh, but, you know, here we are, uh, 58 years removed, still talking about these aircraft that are flying now. Uh, bare metal aircraft, uh, again, uh, like just like you alluded to, that uh, environment is going to be a big uh, part of that as far as any kind of corrosion issues, uh, whether it's in a salt air environment, even uh, paint stripper. You know, if an aircraft's been uh, repainted and uh, the paint's been stripped and, uh, you know, the paint shop is not careful with, uh, paint stripper residue, and it gets into crooks and crevices. Uh, those are going to cause uh, corrosion issues as well. But uh, now Piper aircraft, uh, we're talking about the PA-28s here, but even go back earlier than that, the PA-24, uh, the Comanche aircraft, uh, all of those aircraft were produced with a zinc chromate primer. And you look at the inside of a uh, Piper Comanche, and they're just as clean as can be. You know, and here we are, you know, that's even older yet than the, the Cherokee series of aircraft. Sure. What, what percentage of aircraft out there right now, roughly, would you think are afflicted with corrosion issues, new and old? Oh, boy. It, that, that's hard to say. Um, again, you know, it's going to be on environmental uh, issues. But uh, when you're talking aircraft that are 40, 50 years old, uh, you know, people get an air, an air, buy an airplane, let's say, and uh, it comes in for an annual and the uh, mechanic finds corrosion issues, you know, and so now an owner's upset. I need to go back and, uh, you know, go back to the person that sold this aircraft to me. You know, it's, uh, I need to, uh, be able to get my money back or things like that. Uh, Hey, you know, if, if you bought an old car that was 40 or 50 years old, you would expect it to have mechanical issues. Uh, you know, at some point, somebody's going to have to step up and address corrosion issues. And it's not just corrosion, you know, it's uh, wear and tear, uh, just, uh, you know, thing, things, uh, uh, that get used over time, uh, they're going to have, uh, uh, issues, whether it's corrosion or again, you know, uh, elongated bolt holes and, you know, we overhaul engines all the time and don't think anything about that as far as, uh, you know, it's expected, it's an expected expense uh, for maintaining an aircraft. Well, you know, taking a wing off an airplane to fix a corrosion issue, that might be an expected expense, you know, uh, down the road. Uh, you know, if you own the aircraft and you find the corrosion, it, it's going to be your baby to take care of. You can't go back on a previous owner and say, you sold me a, a default uh, or a faulty aircraft or something like that. Sure. Now I understand. Well, obviously when I think of corrosion or rust, you know, I think of just water sitting on metal for a period of time and then it sets off a chemical reaction and there we go. But are there other ways that corrosion can get started too? Well, you're going to have, of course, you know, we talk environmental, uh, not just moisture, but uh, salt in the air. Uh, you think about the airlines that, uh, you know, they may fly from an inland airport overseas to another inland airport. Hey, they're still flying over the ocean. There's still salt in the air, even at altitude. So, you know, even though it might be minute, it's still considered to be operating in a corrosive environment. So, uh, you know, the, the, the salt in the air, uh, moisture, uh, again, we talk about, uh, you know, paint strippers, uh, different corrosive, uh, even uh, down to, you know, the types of cleaners uh, that people use. If you don't use a, uh, a cleaner that uh, is approved, that uh, that could be just as harmful as, uh, you know, considered to be good for degreasing the aircraft, but cleaning residue might be something that sets off uh, a corrosion event. Uh, but specifically what I see uh, in the, in the wing control service rebuilding business, uh, we get a lot of uh, the galvanic action with dissimilar metals, uh, steel brackets riveted onto aluminum structures uh, for strength purposes. But uh, over time uh, that'll become a uh, corrosion uh spot at, at some point uh, down the road. Interesting. So strong now, but possible corrosion later then. Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Well, are there any particular models of aircraft or aircraft parts that tend to be more susceptible to corrosion than others? Not really. Not really. Uh, you know, we, we talk about different models, you know, should I buy this model versus that model, this manufacturer versus that manufacturer? And, and again, you know, corrosion is not going to, uh, discriminate uh, all models of aircraft are going to be subject to corrosion even you talk about the uh, the restart Cessnas with every part being a chromate epoxy primer uh, you're still going to have uh, issues with corrosion 
uh, because you've got, when they rivet those pieces together, the, the rivets, uh, are bare, you know, they don't go through and coat every single rivet head, uh, after they shoot them together. So, uh, corrosion sets up on a, a rivet tail and then it seeps in within the structure things like that. So, uh, you know, certain models, certain makes, no, there, there's no, uh, uh, really no difference between any of the different models. They're all, uh, you know, for the most part, 2024, T3 outclad aluminum. Uh, so they're all of similar construction as far as the aluminum aircraft. Uh, so your, your, your chances of corrosion are, are going to be more based on, uh, life, uh, you know, uh, you know, based on the usage, based on service, uh, where they're located environment, things like that. I understand. Now, I was doing a little bit of research on, uh, in this case, in particular, Piper, not not to pick on them, but just because that was the type of aircraft that was involved in the, the Embry-Riddle crash that kind of started this whole thought process off. And I found that back, uh, I think it was in uh, 2016, I'm trying to pull up the article right now, December 20th, 2016, AOPA had an article that uh, it says the FAA seeks information on Piper wing spar corrosion, uh, reference to PA-28 and PA-32 models and it was um service bulletin 1244b i think was the result of that that came out and it was to uh, inspect the wing aft spar for corrosion but it requires the installation of an access panel so this was something that i think aopa and the fa were concerned about previously and then you know it ended up actually playing out of course in this embry riddle one and and i don't know if it's played out anywhere else but of course this is one we all know about because it was covered well in the news but are you familiar with that service bulletin Correct. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe you've seen that on our uh, YouTube channel. We have a video specifically to uh, Service Bolton 1244B. Absolutely. Yeah. And your video, by the way, is excellent. And I, I watched a couple of them that were related to it as well. And then on this AOPA article as well, they're showing the, a picture of the main spar. And this metal is just, it's flaking apart. Like a, almost looks like the metal is turned into like a croissant dough or something. And it's just flaking apart in sheets. It's, it's actually, it's quite concerning. So the concern that I have is when I'm going to go fly a Piper, because I fly both Cessnas and Pipers regularly, obviously we do a, a thorough pre-flight and so forth, but what inspections can an owner or a renter or, or just a pilot do? I mean, obviously you can't install an inspection panel during your pre-flight, but is there anything we can do or see or look towards to maybe tip us off if this is an issue in the particular aircraft we're going to fly? Not really. Uh, the corrosion issues are going to be caught in the uh, annual inspections, the hundred hour inspections, because the corrosion is going to be, you know, deep within the structure. It's not going to be something you're going to see uh, at, you know, on a casual walk around. But, you know, you talk about your Piper Seminole, Piper uh, Arrow uh, that you fly. Uh, we had a, a Piper Arrow wing in a 1974 here just recently that uh, a student was getting ready to go fly the airplane, actually take it for a check ride. And uh, on the walk around, at, uh, stood at the wing tip and just kind of put pressure fore and aft on the wing. And he was getting movement in the wing uh, at the tip there, so uh, and, which was showing up as a gap between the wing and the fuselage at the uh, inboard end of the wing. Uh, they, the mechanic, he went and got the mechanic. Mechanic brought it in. Says, "Yeah, you're right. We're gonna we're gonna ground the aircraft. Let's take a look at this thing." I hear the forward fitting of the uh, wing. Uh, there's a bushing in there. That bushing had either dis disintegrated or had uh, come loose and uh, just allowed the bolt to work within the bolt hole. And again, we've got a video on that on the uh, Piper wing spars explained. It shows uh, what started out as a AN4 bolt hole, a quarter inch bolt hole was uh, actually over a half inch in diameter. I did more than that much, but uh, uh on a walk around, uh, I would say, you know, the best thing to do would be just to simply uh, grasp onto the wing, grasp onto the tail, and just see if there's any movement in there. Uh, again, it's not going to show if there's corrosion, but it would show the effects of corrosion or, you know, elongated uh, fittings or bolt holes that, you know, may have been caused by corrosion. Okay. Yeah. Cause what you just described, I believe is the exact thing that happened to me and I didn't discover it myself, nor did my student, but it was, as you said, during an annual inspection, they had the aircraft up on, up on jack stands, they were doing a gear swing. And then when they put it down, somebody noticed that the wing had moved a little bit. So they put it back up and it was exactly as you described, you could grab the wing out at the tip, you know, kind of jerk it fore and aft and it would, it would move. 
exactly as you described. And I, I believe it was more of a, a the bolt hole working loose thing as opposed to a corroded spar. But that type of thing is really hard to detect, of course, during a during a walk around. I mean, I was sending CFI students almost once a week out in this airplane for for check rides and, you know, no pilot examiner, student, myself, nobody was able to discover it. It took the thing being up on jack stands in an annual to actually figure that out. But of course, after it did, you know, my blood ran cold because I flew that airplane two or three times a day. So, I mean, I was scared to death and I, they did end up fixing it. And then somebody, of course, unfortunately uh, wrecked the aircraft again later. But it, the idea that that kind of thing could be hiding that deep is is a little bit scary to me. Well, and then also, you know, you think about as pilots, you know, how many times are we guilty of doing a casual walk around or you have, uh, you know, say a passenger that's flying for the first time. And so you're trying to be casual and, you know, fun and not, you know, uh, be real uh, alarmed or, you know, draw attention to the aircraft. So, uh, or we're in a hurry, we want to get the airplane running because, you know, daylight's fading or we got to be somewhere. And so we do a quick walk around and we don't really pay attention to the, the small stuff, the details. Uh, you know, every once in a while, it, it doesn't hurt to stop and, you know, look at every single hinge fitting, look at every single bolt and actually, you know, feel, is that bolt tight? Is that hinge snug? Is that wing secure? You know, it's uh, uh, sometimes a, a walk around should take a little bit longer than usual, not just uh, check the gas and oil and jump in and go. I understand. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Now, I heard a rumor, and, and I don't know if you've heard this one, but there was an, an, an airworthiness directive or, or maybe it was just a, something circulating in the pilot community about spraying linseed oil inside of uh, the wings that were not manufactured with the uh, corrosion proofing in order to prevent that. Is, some, is that something you've heard of? As far as a pending AD or I think this uh, was a while back. Yeah, I think okay. it was a while ago. It was sort of about like a, hey, you could probably prevent corrosion by spraying this inside here because it would more or less, I mean, if you spread Vaseline on anything, it'll, you know, it'll keep it from corroding or something. But, uh, but yeah, the idea that you could just spray a bunch of linseed oil inside of a, a non-corrosion proofed wing to prevent corrosion, is, is that really a thing? And you have like the ACF 50 or the Corrosion X products. Uh, and there's actually uh, shops that are dealers or, you know, uh, installers for this uh, product where they have the wands uh, that will actually reach, you know, deep down inside of a wing or inside of a fuselage and mist that oil in there. And it is a good product. Uh, it does it does help uh, coat the uh, inside of the structure. Uh, it does help, you know, seal it off, help pre prevent corrosion. Uh, of course, uh, in, in our line of work where we uh, rebuild the wings and control services, uh, we've got the all torn apart. You know, the skins are off, the structures are apart. So we clean everything. And, of course, we do the, the chromate epoxy primer just like uh, manufacturers do at the factory. But, uh, but you know, if an airplane's flying and, you know, intact and all together, then definitely the, uh, the ACF-50 or the Corrosion X products are, are a good thing to have. Uh, you talk about linseed oil. Uh, linseed oil was used on the the old, uh, like say the J three Cubs, the J five Cubs, anything with the uh, the forty one thirty uh, chromoly steel struts, uh, where they were having rust issues with the struts. And so there again, you know, here's aircraft that were built back in the forties uh, that they had aging aircraft issues. You know, let's say 30, 40 years ago. Uh, you know, there's an AD on the uh, wing struts on the pipers. Uh, though that had to do with the threads uh, on the uh, clevis ends at the uh, top and bottom ends of the uh, struts. Uh, but you know, they had problems with uh, those uh, steel struts having rust issues, not corrosion, but rust. And so they had a, a, a fix where you would pour linseed oil inside the strut. Uh, slosh the strut around to coat uh, all the interior surfaces just to prevent rust from happening on the steel struts. But, uh, and again, where you, you see the parallels, uh, you know, the, this whole Piper wing separation issue has brought everybody's uh, attention to, you know, Hey, let's take a look, see what these wings look like. Uh, and so people realize, Hey, wait a minute, there's only one bolt attaching uh, the forward portion of the wing. There's only one bolt attaching the rear portion of the wing. Well, look back at these old J3 Cubs and such, you know, similar aircraft like that, where they have just a uh, fork uh, end uh, that's threaded uh, at each end of the strut. 
you know, so when, when you say I'm hanging by a thread, uh, you know, those older aircraft, uh, have that style of, uh, wing strut attach fitting and here they are still flying as well. So, uh, you know, the, these aircraft have been designed well, they're, they're strong, uh, they hold together, uh, you know, as long as they're properly maintained, there, there's not going to be a, uh, a safety of flight issue, but, uh, but definitely, uh, you know, or whether we talk the in- linseed oil on steel or, uh, ACF 50 or corrosion X on aluminum, uh, they're, they're all good products. Okay. Now, when it comes to inspecting these, uh, these wing spars, at least on pipers, uh, since that's what we're talking about. I understand that you really need to install an inspection panel, and I, I saw your video on that, of course, and um, that was what the, the advisory circular, or the, sorry, the service bulletin had mentioned to do. When it comes to installing an inspection panel on a piper, is that something that people have actually been doing? Oh, for sure, yeah. And that's, uh, uh, there's actually several different service bulletins uh, specifically pertaining to uh, inspection of the structure of these wings. Uh, the, the 1244 that you mentioned has you looking at the aft attach fitting plate, uh, service bolt in 1304, uh, has you using the same inspection hole that you install looking forward onto the forward spar, uh, of the wing, uh, right there at the inboard portion of the wing where it attaches to the, uh, fuselage. Uh, there's another service bolt in 1006, a Piper service bolt in where they have you pull the fuel tank out of the wing. Uh, they ha- they're having you change the flexible fuel lines in there, but also while the tank is out, uh, looking in, uh, and just taking that opportunity to, uh, get in there and look around on the structure of the wing as well. So, so again, you know, and not just Piper, but, uh, and Cessna was very big on this back in the late eighties, early nineties, as far as just going through the fleet and seeing where the problem areas were, how they could be, uh, addressed, uh, whether it was through improved, uh, parts or just, uh, regular inspections. Okay. Well, that sounds good. I'm glad to hear people are actually doing it. I mean, that, that seems like kind of a, a, I mean, there might be a, a cost associated with doing that, but I mean, then again, the payoff would be, you, you couldn't measure that. I mean, if you detect spar corrosion, what could be more important than that, right? Oh, the, the cost would be minimal. I mean, the, the kit, uh, the aircraft inspection, uh, whole kit, I think, you know, is what one hundred and fifty dollars? I think, and that's uh, that includes two inspection plates, one for each wing, and you know, what's it going to take? A couple hours, maybe per wing, to and you know, cut a hole and install the the impan- the panel in there. So, uh, you know, for for what little it takes to uh, put that kit in, there, there's a lot to be gained as far as uh, uh, just the the knowledge of knowing what's underneath the the wing there, the wing skins. Yeah, it makes me feel good to know that the the cost associated with that is is so minimal that there's really no excuse for an owner not to do it, right? Correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, you know, before we started recording here, we spoke about uh, the different Piper wings, such as uh, the PA twenty eight, the PA thirty two, and you told me something I didn't know, which was that even on the the Saratoga or Cherokee six, the thirty two models, that the wing root is more or less the same the same part or the same construction as the the twenty eight. Did I get that right? Correct. All of the, you know, again, starting with the, the very first PA-28 prototype, uh, that particular style of uh, wing construction is used on all of your PA-28 series aircraft. And I'm talking the Hershey bar wing versus the uh, taper wings. Uh, the PA-32 series aircraft, again, Hershey bar versus taper wings. Uh, your PA-34 Senecas, your PA-44 Seminoles. Uh, they all start with the base design, the base structure of uh, spar and forward and atta- aft attach fittings. Uh, and then they just build on them from there, adding more structure depending on the gross weight of the aircraft. Again, if you have an engine hanging out there on the wing versus a uh, single engine, things like that. But they all start with the same basic design. Interesting. Okay. And then as far as the Hershey bar versus the semi-tapered wings that are the, the newer style, what the the base is still the same they just add the 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 second half so to speak is is just looks different correct everything from the fuselage out to where the flap ends is the same on all of your pa28 pa32 series aircraft uh then from there on out uh, of course uh, the hershey bar just stays constant cord there on out uh then the what they call the semi taper wing uh from the 
from the end of the flap outboard then is that that's where the, the airfoil changes but everything uh, from there inboard is all the same essentially on uh, all the piper aircraft interesting so even like the seneca would it be the same out to the to the end of the flap or is that different a little bit different because the seneca has a longer flap on there so that is you know same style just extended a little bit further because uh, to accommodate the longer flap area on a seneca but again you know uh, they all start with the same basic I-beam construction uh, of uh, structure and then uh, just build upon that with extra, uh, say, your uh, PA-32 series, your Lances, uh, your, uh, and then on to your Saratogas, uh, where they add extra angles in there, extra plates, again, to accommodate the, the higher gross weight of these load-hauling aircraft. Okay, and, and a question that I've had for you, and this is on behalf of both myself and the the actual owner of the Cherokee Six that I fly. It's one of the the very first generation uh, PA thirty two three hundred Cherokee Six models, and of course that has four fuel tanks in it, uh, the inboards and the outboards. And I should say I often hear about different ways to to manage your fuel and how to burn it, whether you burn the outboards first or the inboards first. Does that affect uh, the, the load? Obvi- well, it does obviously affect the load on the wing spar, but uh, what are your thoughts on that? Do you burn the outboards first or the inboards first, or what's the right way to do it in a six? Well, and again, you know, in, in my opinion, uh, in my uh, fuel management, I had a Cherokee 235 uh, for years, that uh, same uh, style of wing with the outboard tip tanks. Uh, just four seats instead of the six seats of the Cherokee six. But, uh, you know, getting that weight off of the tips is, uh, what I, you know, from a mechanics point of view is, is, uh, a priority, uh, not just for flight or for stress, uh, in flight, but, uh, say coming back into land, let's say we take off with full, uh, tanks, uh, inboards and outboards, uh, we got to go back, uh, early you know for weather we forgot something even the uh something's not right the radios aren't working we come back in we land you got all that weight out there at the outboard end of the uh wing uh you know if you don't uh, grease it in and uh, land smooth uh, a hard landing uh, you're putting all that extra stress on the structure of the uh of the wing uh, with that extra weight of the fuel out there so so in my opinion you know the the first thing to do is to get the the fuel burned out of the tip tanks first just to get the weight off of them and then and then switch to your uh inboard tanks uh, later and again you know just the arm of that extra weight out there is going to affect the the way the aircraft flies and how it handles in flight absolutely well it's great to know that you have a lot of flying experience in addition to your mechanical experience when did you start flying uh, let's see. I actually, 1986, I got my, uh, private pilot's license the same day I graduated from high school. Wow. That's really cool. So would you say aviation runs in your family? <laughs> I, I, I grew up with a, uh, when, when I was a, a baby, uh, the, the air compressor was kept underneath my crib in my room. So, so yeah, I, uh, I've been around airplanes a while. <laughs> Sounds like it'd be difficult to sleep that way. Well, that's it. it wasn't running, but uh, that's where it was stored. So uh, the the whole the whole beginning of this whole uh, uh, wing and control service rebuilding empire, if you will, uh, had had some pretty humble beginnings. <laughs> well, I guess the last question I have for you then, and and the question that was burning in my mind, of course, before we started talking, was if I go out each and every day and I fly whatever I fly, an older Cessna, a newer Piper, it doesn't really matter what it is. Is everything going to be okay? Oh yeah. No, that's, you know, everybody's, uh, scared and uh, very cognizant of the fact of, uh, uh, there might be issues, but, but again, you know, think how many tens of thousands of hours, the whole general aviation fleet flies in a year. Uh, and, and specifically in this case, uh, the Piper aircraft, the tens of thousands of hours that they fly number of flights they make the number of cycles that are flown every day, every year in these aircraft. Uh, you know, so, so one wing coming off and again, not to make light of the situation, but, but one wing coming off of an aircraft over that many tens of thousands of hours, you know, that's not a trend, that's an anomaly. So, uh, you know, at this point we're all, you know, eyeball engineering, we're all, uh, armchair quarterbacking as far as trying to guess 
what happened, what's going to come about, you know, what, what they're going to recommend for a corrective action. You know, we're all just guessing at this point. And, and they've said, you know, the NTSB has said this could take up to two years to, you know, publish all of our findings on this particular uh, incident here. Uh, so, so until that official report comes out, you know, we're all just kind of guessing at what, uh, what may be going on there. So, so this YouTube video gets a lot of play and, you know, look at all this corrosion. Hey, you know, that's, again, that's, that's just the result of 50 year old airplanes. Uh, so, so, you know, there, there's not, nothing has changed. You know, the, the fleet still goes on to still, uh, still continue to fly. So, you know, there, there's not an, uh, an impending, uh, in, you know, situation where all these airplanes are going to start falling out of the sky. Uh, you know, the, 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 the fleet is still safe. And uh, again, you know, just very cognizant uh, maintenance, uh, you know, being aware of, uh, you know, and owners, especially owners being involved in the maintenance of the aircraft and getting inside and seeing what the inside of that structure looks like. Uh, these videos that we publish uh, showing a wing by itself off the aircraft and people say, I didn't realize that was all that held that wing on there. But yet again, that design has worked well for 58 years. Uh, so, so again, you know, just because one wing came off doesn't mean they're all going to come off. But again, it, you have to be aware of, uh, as the fleet ages, you know, you may be called upon, you may be owning the airplane at the time that corrosion is found. You may have to spend some money in, uh, putting new structure in that wing. You know, it'll continue to fly afterward and it'll fly well, but, uh, you know, you may be stuck with the, the person that, uh, has the misfortune, let's say, of uh, owning the aircraft when corrosion is found. And, you know, the mechanic says, no, we can't sign this thing off until uh, we correct this uh, issue, whether it's uh, wear or corrosion or, uh, you know, any number of uh, uh, facts. Uh, specifically, again, if we can uh, just divert for a little bit here, uh, on the Piper wing spars, we talk about this corrosion issue. Uh, the inboard spars on a Piper wing are made of an extruded material. And so when they corrode, you talk about, you know, how they come apart looking like uh, croissant, you know, like flaky dough. And that's uh, that's how that uh, extruded metal will corrode to come apart in layers like that. And so you see a little bubble of corrosion, you start picking at it, and that hole just starts to get bigger and bigger and, and deeper and deeper. And, and it just it comes apart in layers, just like you said there. Uh, but even your, uh, your Cessna aircraft, they have uh, extruded, uh, portions within their wings. So same thing, uh, that style of, uh, manufacturing with an extruded metal will corrode from the inside out, the skins, the ribs, uh, stringers, things like that. Those are formed with sheet material. And so when that material corrodes, it typically just corrodes from the surface down. So if you see a little bit of surface corrosion, you, uh, scour it, you know, get rid of the corrosion, treat the metal, prime it, and you're done. So, uh, again, it's, it's not the manufacturers, uh, it's not different models of airplanes, it's just the, the different styles of uh, uh, manufacturing that are used on these different structures uh, that seem to be more susceptible uh, to corrosion or more catastrophic as far as uh, if corrosion does happen, uh, whether it's uh, repairable by just simply treating the metal or whether it corrodes from the inside out and that calls for replacement of a main spar, replacement of a main piece of structure, which again, uh, in and of itself is not that difficult, you know, relatively not that difficult. Interesting. Now this is actually a good, uh, if we can take just a quick second for a vocabulary lesson, the word extruded that gets thrown around a lot as do a lot of other technical terms, but what does that actually mean? So where you're extruding the metal, where you're actually forcing it through a die to get a particular shape, a particular form, a profile, uh, you know, when you're moving that metal through this die, you're aligning all the molecules uh, in that metal in a, a particular uh, uh, direction, a, a particular fashion, and a, a, an orientation. So, uh, the again, we say, you know, they all start with the same basic structure. Uh, you, all your Piper aircraft, PA-28, PA-32 uh, aircraft, start with this extruded, I, and I call it an I-beam, uh, which is what your main spar, the, the profile is. And uh, and then they, uh, once they get that rough uh, profile, then they start to machine it 
and uh, they put the bend in it for the dihedral of the wing, start adding plates to it to, uh, you know, whether it's a fixed gear, retractable gear, uh, you know, they start to cut the lightning holes, things like that, drill the holes for the attached fittings uh, where, where the wing attaches to the fuselage. So uh, uh, again, the, the Piper our, uh, aircraft start with this extruded uh, I-beam spar. Uh, your Cessna aircraft, they uh, start with just a piece of channel that's made from sheet material. And that'd just be like, you know, coil stock, uh, just like a sheet of steel or a sheet, again here, a sheet of aluminum. And then they, they bend and form that, but then they add different angles and uh, we call them, you know, lambs or laminations of different uh, layers uh, to, to give strength to the wing. But some of those angles are made from an extruded metal uh, where they've forced that metal through a die to get a particular profile they're looking for uh, in the construction of the wing. Wow. Okay. I, I learned a lot today. I'll tell you what. <laughs> yeah. Are we thoroughly confused now? No, no. This is this is amazing. Thank you so much. This has been a, a just an incredible lesson in, in so many different topics that I think most people, I mean, how often do you really get to speak with somebody who knows this that well? I mean, you talk with your CFI or you maybe make a visit to the shop a couple of times as you're learning. But I mean, how often do you really get the opportunity to go this in depth with somebody who knows this stuff inside and out? I, I really appreciate it. Well, and again, you know, we, we looked at different designs and you think of like a, a Cessna wing. And when I say Cessna, I'm talking 150, 172, 182, 206, your typical garden variety strutted uh, Cessna. Uh, you know, those are held with just two bolts uh, right above your head there in, you know, as you sit in the uh, cockpit. Then, of course, you have the strut that supports the wing. Uh, with one bolt at each end of that. So basically four bolts holding that whole wing in place on that. Uh, and you think, you know, my goodness, you know, these things are, you know, barely held on, you know, with, uh, there's not much holding these uh, all together here. But yet again, you know, you think about the, the life of these things, when these were designed, they've held for this many years, obviously uh, they're, they're doing something right. And that's, you know, even like Burt Rutan, you know, I think about, you know, the, the godfather of aircraft design, let's call him, uh, you know, he's all about saving weight and uh, making airplanes as light as possible. And and one article I read that he uh, was quoted in saying, you know, if a designer says to cut a part, you know, exactly one inch or whatever, you know, if if he gives you a dimension, make that part exactly what the designer says to make it not any bigger, not any thicker, not any thinner you know, do exactly what the designer says because the designer has specifically engineered that particular surface or connection, you know, to withstand a certain weight or a certain force, things like that. So again, you know, if you put me in charge of designing a, an airplane, it'd be so heavy, it'd never come off the ground because it'd have so many plates and extra bolts and things like that. So you got to think these aircraft have been designed to achieve maximum strength with minimum weight. Uh, and again, you know, think of all the tens of thousands of hours, hundreds of thousands of hours, let's say, of uh, that the GA uh, fleet flies worldwide every year without uh, incident, uh, without wings falling off. So again, you know, uh, a wing separate, one wing separation is 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 not a trend, uh, but but it's a wake up call, let's say, to uh, be more aware, be more cognizant of uh, what's going on within these structures of these 40, 50 year old aircraft. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So if people want to get in touch with you or maybe have uh, your skilled hands rebuild their corroded aileron, how can people get in touch with you? You can get on our website, uh, airframecomponents.com. Uh, of course, that's got our, all of our contact information. Again, you know, this is just my little corner of the world, uh, wing rebuilding, control service rebuilding. And again, we're we're more focused on uh, your your garden variety aircraft, the ones that there's uh, thousands of aircraft flying, the, the Cessna 172, 182s, the uh, Cherokee, Cherokee 6s, the uh, Bonanzas, the Barons, things like that. Uh, and, and where we're just, just specifically wings and controls, you, you get beyond that, you're outside of my, uh, area of expertise, but, uh, it's something that we've, uh, focused on over, you know, again, uh, this many years that, uh, the, the thousands of, uh, components that we repaired, I mean, we kind of have a little bit of a track record of knowing uh, where to start looking for problems. So, uh, again, you know, I, I'm not going to be the person to, uh, ring, you know, wring my hands and say the sky is falling that, uh, uh, the, the, the 
GA fleet is perfectly safe and, uh, you know, will continue to fly. And, uh, uh, it's just, again, it's just a matter of, uh, being aware of, uh, that you may be the person that's called upon to, uh, you know, have to spend the money to, uh, continue the life of an airplane. If, you know, if you find corrosion, things like that, that, Hey, we're going to have to, you know, put a new spar, right. I have to put some new structure in this wing. And again, if you get on our website, uh, the airframe components, there's plenty of, uh, uh, pictures in there of our warehouse that we keep all the components on hand uh, for any wing repair, any control service repair. Uh, we have a uh, complete inventory on hand so we don't have to stop and order uh, any parts uh, for a specific repair that everything's in stock, ready to go. And again, you know, we have the luxury of having a, a track record, knowing which parts are going to uh, be a problem area. If there is going to be a problem area, where do we uh, need to have uh, the parts on hand there because uh, if a wing comes in, it may have uh, damage in one, a different area other than where, uh, you know, it shows up for a repair. There may be other areas we want to look at while we have it in hand there just to make sure that uh, everything is up to snuff before that component leaves our shop. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we go? Well, and that, you know, uh, same way, uh, like we started the show here where you found us simply through our YouTube channel, uh, and, and again, this YouTube channel was my little, uh, way of just being able to educate, uh, customers the same way, uh, you've got your podcast here that, uh, you know, how do we bring attention to, how do we educate people? How do we let people know about specific issues? And, and the whole idea of having the YouTube channel was to, uh, simply bring, uh, education to ultimately the end user. Uh, if they are you know aware of, here's what the you know, problem is, here's what the old part looks like. Here's what the new part looks like. Here's what happens when the part comes to our facility. Here's how we take it apart and change everything out, whatnot. Uh, and I'm always telling people, Hey, if there's something in particular you want to see, let me know. We'll do a video about it again. You know, the whole thing is about making, uh, uh, specifically owners and pilots aware of, uh, what's going on in those, uh, inside the airplanes, uh, just to better educate them. And again, you know, it, it, the more educated you are, the more comfortable you are making decisions concerning the maintenance of the aircraft. But, uh, again, the, you know, the YouTube video is just kind of a, uh, YouTube channel is just kind of a thing to, uh, help educate people. And, and again, you know, the more uh, cognizant, uh, you are of, uh, situations or, uh, particular problem areas, uh, the more uh, comfortable you are, uh, making a decision to, you know, how do we go about correcting that? Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, this has been an incredible lesson in what's going on inside the wings. And for anybody who's interested in what's going on inside the wings of your aircraft, absolutely go check out, uh, Roy Williams YouTube channel. There's of course going to be a link in the show notes. Roy, this has been an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Brandon, thanks for having me on. And, uh, again, please feel free to call me anytime. Uh, always glad to chat about airplanes. Well, I don't know about you, but I feel a whole lot better after hearing Roy speak, that's for sure. It's still scary to think that a wing has ever just come off an airplane. But at least for now, I can feel like how remote I thought that possibility was is probably still valid. I want to send a special thank you out to Fred Inager and Sean Lathrop at WAWK 95.5 The Hawk, which is apparently the voice of northeastern Indiana since 1956. These gentlemen provided an amazing studio setup for Roy to speak with us in. You can check out their website and stream it live at wawk.com. And while you're there, you can enjoy some classic hits. Our website, of course, is podcastingonaplane.com. And while you're there, you can find links to all the ways to follow us on social media, including Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Patreon. Because if you find value in the podcast and you want to support the show, check out patreon.com slash podcastingonaplane. You can see our future goals for the show and find out how you can become a valued supporter. And hey, if money's tight, I get it. That's cool. Maybe just head over to iTunes and leave a positive review. It's free and it will go a long way to help me improve the show and to help others find the podcast. Well, that's all for now. Thanks again for listening. Your frequency change is approved until next time, and a part back on this frequency for the next episode. Good day. Good day.